and thank you for joining me for another art reflection this evening. Um, I thought that we might think about a building today. We've um, talked about a photograph and a painting in the last couple of weeks. Um, and in our morning services lately, we've been thinking about Nehemiah and the rebuilding of Jerusalem's walls and gates. So I thought it might be intriguing to think about the way that buildings, just as much as paintings, photographs, sculptures, any other medium, can have a meaning and a significance and can often present us with new ways of understanding God, especially religious buildings. Now, I could have picked a London building, but actually I haven't, um, I'm afraid, so you'd have to go a little bit of a way to visit this one. Um, I did once, and it was a bit of a trek, a um, bit of a road trip. David will remember it well. Uh, but I have chosen a building that is especially dear to me and belongs to the period of art and architecture that I usually work on, which is 20th century France. And for me, this speaks to a variety of elements of Jesus' ministry. Now, as we look at it, you might think of buildings that you know, and you might start to think, how does this building speak to me? What is this building trying to tell me as I exist in it, as I experience it, as I walk through it? Well, that's what I'm going to do with this building from France in 1955. This is a pilgrimage church on the site of a previous church that had been bombed during the Second World War. It's high up on a hill um, in the, near the, the foothills of the Alps, really, the French Alps, in a place called Ronchon. And it's called Notre Dame du Haut, Our Lady of the Heights. Um, it's a Catholic church, but it is a pilgrimage church. And that strikes me as being quite relevant to the period of Lent. We may think of Lent as a pilgrimage up to Easter. It was built by a very famous architect. He's called Le Corbusier, and he's best known for his concrete housing designs, I suppose. He only does a couple of religious buildings in his time, um, or a handful at least. And this was a church that had been commissioned under the banner of something called La Sacre, Sacred Art, which was an attempt to renew the commissions of the church um, for modern artists. Um, the church, it was felt, had stagnated rather and had stopped commissioning good art because it was so intent on commissioning art by people that they could be sure were faithful Christians. Um, and one particular person, um, a monk called Père Marie-Alain Couturier, decided that all true art was sacred and that it would be better to engage men of genius who had no faith than believers who had no talent. Um, and so he sought to enliven, really, um, and renew the relationship between the church and modern artists. And the result was a number of really, really interesting projects of which this is one. Now, you can have a think about that. Do you have to be a Christian to build a church? And I wonder what impact it has on the unbelieving or perhaps doubting um, agnostic, maybe, architect to think through the theology behind the building that they are creating. Anyway, here it is. Um, the roof is one of the most interesting things. It's one of the things that people notice first, I think. And so we'll begin with the roof. And it's, it's made of concrete. The whole building is made of concrete. And you can make concrete in a variety of different ways. You can pour it, you can mould it, you can make it off site. You can then bring it on site and put it together. Um, and if you look at the roof and the main part of this building, you'll see that they, though they are made of the same material, they look quite different from each other. So the main building itself, the, the sort of walls of that building and the, the towers, um, they are painted. They're made of quite rough concrete um, and they're, they're painted white, which gives it this real sort of stark presence, a sort of sense of purity sitting there on the hillside. And then in contrast, the roof um, is made of this quite rough concrete which hasn't been painted and you can see there the lines um, which um, relate to the planks of wood that would have formed the mould for this roof. And it's been poured in such a way that this really heavy material looks actually quite fluid um, and it looks almost weightless sitting there on the top of this hefty white um, sculptural structure. Um, the shape for the roof was actually based around a crab shell that Le Corbusier had found walking along the beach at um, Long Island. So it's based on a form from nature. And that strikes me as being quite interesting, actually. The roof is also used, it has a functional purpose, it collects water. So it functions as a type of reservoir, and that provides water um, for the use of the church um, on top of the hillside, where it's otherwise quite difficult to get water up the hill. But I wonder if it might also be a symbol of baptism, 
sometimes in infant baptism a shell is used to pour water over the child's head um, and even with adult baptism the shell is often a symbol of John the Baptist for example. And I think baptism is understood as being a little bit of a threshold moment um, so perhaps this is the entry point to the church. It's not the door but it might be an entry point. For Jesus it marked the start of his ministry didn't it? And for Christians it represents belonging to the family of God or perhaps the sign of a decision to turn and follow Christ. A sense of washing or cleansing, something that signifies coming in to relationship with God. And I think this is a church which is all about that really. It functions quite differently but very much connectedly on the inside and the outside. Now you might think that that's obvious. The outside of a building will define the shape of the inside but then sometimes we also find that the inside defines the shape of the outside. Here I think the inside and the outside have very different effects, but they are connected. And let's stick with the outside for a moment. Um, now, as I say, it's a pilgrimage church. It's up a hill, takes a little bit of effort to get up there. And sometimes you would have congregations of thousands. There are photographs from the 50s and 60s of thousands of people sitting on the hill around the church. And you can see there that there's an outside pulpit and even an outside altar. You could serve communion for thousands of people. You could preach to thousands of people um, in one go. And there's even, now this is perhaps the thing that marked it out as a Catholic church, there's even a little Mary figure in that um, enclave there, that little square space, which can either face inside or outside. She's on an axis, on a pivot, um, and she can face in both directions. That's the one thing actually that's left from the old building that had stood on that site. Um, so services can be held for as many people as can fit themselves on the hill. And that sort of reminds me of the Sermon on the Mount, perhaps, or the feeding of the 5,000 in Jesus's ministry, as many people as can gather. The church exists for mission, doesn't it? It exists for the people who are outside of its walls, whether that's metaphorically or literally. Now, I think the exterior of this church is initially a little bit confusing. It seems slightly off center. Where's the front? Where is the door? How do you get into this building? It's quite hard to see, actually. And I wonder if that is intended, certainly from Le Corbusier's point of view, and we can tell a lot about struggles with faith sometimes from looking at churches as well, that perhaps reflects the experience of trying to come to God sometimes. But it's not always a clear route. It's not always linear or obvious. We know that we believe there is one way to God, and that is Jesus, but sometimes getting to Jesus can happen in a variety of different ways. There is more than one entrance. The main entrance is round at the side, um, at the side on, on a right angle with the side that's got the pulpit um, that you can see there. Um, so we'll go in through that main entrance, but even that main entrance is fairly small, all things considered. Perhaps it is a narrow gate. Now, as you go inside, the atmosphere of the church is quite different, I think. The bright white of the outside turns into a series of evocative shadows on the inside and that's really emphasised I think by the rough texture of those walls. Um, they're very much um, stucco effect and they're really thick walls and um, they vary in um, size actually. You can see that they're thicker at the bottom in places than they are at the top for example and in some places those walls are at least two metres thick. Now interestingly enough they don't really need to be um, they're not load-bearing walls. Le Corbusier didn't like load-bearing walls. He liked pillars because that gave you more flexibility as an architect. You could um, do what you liked with the walls as long as the roof um, was, and the, the various stories of the house, perhaps, were being held up by pillars. Um, and if you look um, up to the interior edge of the, of the top of the wall and you see where the roof joins that, you can see small pillars every so often and that's what's holding up that huge heavy concrete roof. So the walls don't really need to be that thick so they must be thick for another reason, they must be thick um, for an aesthetic purpose, for, for the way that that makes us feel or the way that it makes us um, look at the building. Um, let's just go back up to the, the top of the walls for a minute and see that connection to the roof because the weight of that heavy concrete roof is kind of denied. Again it looks almost weightless there's a beam of light separating it from the building beneath and it looks quite ethereal. And I wonder if that is intended to remind us of the division, perhaps, between heaven and earth. 
that heaven is something which we always think of as being ethereal and above us, but actually it is a concrete um, idea, if you can have a concrete idea. God is real. Heaven is real. It's something to be believed in, not just a fiction. And yet it looks as though it is not reliant on earth below it. God does not rely on us, but he is connected to us in certain places and he beams light down from heaven into earth. So that division is interesting. Perhaps we might think about it as the division between earth and sky, um, the earth and the waters, some of those separations that we hear about in the creation story. I don't know how you look at that. But light pierces this building all over the place, actually, through the small windows at the side, too. And if you look at the shape of those, they're rather like the windows of a fortress, protecting the space against incoming arrows, perhaps. Um, and not literally, um, but I think the idea of protection is quite an interesting one. The shape of those windows diffuses the light into the interior in a really interesting way. But it also does make it seem like a very protective space. It's been suggested that this um, interior looks a little bit womb-like um, and perhaps if we think about who it's dedicated to, Saint Marie de la Tourette, Mary the mother of Jesus, actually the womb um, of Mary who gave birth to Jesus is an interesting image I think. We might also go back to a couple of things we've mentioned in the last couple of weeks. Nicodemus, um, who was told by Jesus that he would have to be born again. And that idea of 40, the weeks of gestation related to the time in the desert. And we might think about issues of rebirth. But of course, in this dark atmosphere, we're also thinking about night, perhaps. And it's often at night that God reveals himself to his people, perhaps through dreams, through angels, through the overnight provision of manna in the desert. Um, and Jesus often goes to speak to his father overnight. So the darkness is evocative. And I think there's a sense in which this is a church which is built both for mission, for the people who will gather on the hillside outside it to willingly hear God's word, but also to deal with the inside. Um, it's about faith that would allow God to search deep, such that the experience of worship can be transformative. Um, perhaps everything is not centred, everything is not clear and obvious and linear. This church doesn't seem to seek to teach us something. It's not didactic in the way that older churches might be, but it represents the struggle that we might have sometimes between the interior and the exterior, um, a struggle that Jesus pointed out in the lives of the Pharisees. He desires a heart that is as pure as the white of the exterior of that church. And the experience of coming to worship is something that helps God to build that in us. So I wonder what we're doing this week to let God search us within and transform us. And what we're doing that is outward facing and missional, showing him to others around us. If Christians are the church, I wonder what image people see of God when they look at us. What is God's building plan through us? Um, you may one day go to Ronsham, you may have already been to Ronsham. I don't know, I'd love to hear if you have, and I'd love to hear what you made of it. Um, but we all go into buildings, don't we? So next time you go into a building, perhaps even St Mark's, have a think, what um, might God be telling you through that space? What might the building be saying to you? What might the architect be trying to suggest? buildings are fascinating. I think there's a reason that God often uses them as a metaphor in the Bible. Thank you very much. Amen.